Now we'll talk about how, or at least I will ask the question about whether universities have lost their way. I did a bit of crowdsourcing and um, uh, there were interesting ones like um, she likes her food, uh, other kind people said she has a good dress sense, um, still other people said she's really kind and caring and humble and loyal but the one that really grabbed me was you know there are these name tests that people do and this is what it said her smile belies the difficult life that she's had and that, you know, she's had a more difficult time than one would imagine. And I really kind of liked that and warmed to that because it made me feel like, wow, I'm quite strong and resilient. I love my walks in the parks and the park connectors and I very much enjoy photography. So um, whether it's people and places or flowers and festivities or art and architecture, I sometimes write poems about them. I actually have quite a lot of games that are downloaded on my phone and I like to think that they help me with my neuroplasticity. I remain interested and have been interested in intercommunal relations and social cohesion. And this is really um, born of the fact that I am born and bred in Singapore. And most recently, I have been doing research on smart cities. And one might say, hmm, what's that got to do with uh, social cohesion and things like that? For example, when you think about how technology pervades society, how is it impacting on different communities differently? Early in my PhD years, my then supervisor from a London university encouraged me to put my first piece of work out to a major top journal in my field. And I was excited, thrilled and frightened and I thought, my work? Can it ever appear in a journal like that? But with that encouragement, I tried and lo and behold, it was accepted. It broke a ceiling not just for me, but I think for my discipline, my department, and broadly the cognate discipline. A second, professionally I think, was when I was appointed Dean at a very young age. Um, I was 35, and I remember a comment that was made about how this individual felt that he was used to working with people with 35 years of experience, not 35 years of age. And I learned from very early on that there was such a thing as age discrimination, and that in the face of these sorts of sentiments, one had to especially carry ourselves with greater maturity. A third defining moment for me was about gender. There have been many moments when people kind of think, well, you know, as a woman, are you going to be able to make these tough decisions? Are you going to be able to lead with conviction? Are you going to be too soft and so forth? And one has to find one's own approach to leadership and one's own approach to style. I think um, sometimes in very pragmatic societies, in Asian societies, there is a tendency to think about education as education for careers. Over the years, I have come to think of higher education as education for life as well. While we're very pragmatic and we think about, oh, can our students get jobs and so forth, it is equally, if not more important, to prepare our students for life. And that means a broader kind of education, um, a longer term view of what education means. A second is in terms of research. And in this rush for global competition, there is a tendency to think about research for academic merit and academic standing and reputation. But quite as important is research for societal benefit. What is the value of a university and its research if academics are only talking to themselves? A key abiding theme that will run through all three lectures is the public value of universities and how there is no such thing as just a single public value. The public value of universities will need to reflect the historical and societal conditions at any one point in time. If you look at it historically, you will begin to understand how different circumstances shape the institutions that societies need 
and deserve. I will then move on to talk about the public value of universities in today's day and age. And I will talk about how, or at least I will ask the question about whether universities have lost their way. And third, we tend to think of universities as catering to what would be called the traditional age students from 18 to 23 or 24. But if we're to live a 100 year life, are we only as universities going to be relevant for that narrow stretch of time early in one's life? And how are we to think of universities' redefined mission and responsibilities? Thank you.